So, welcome back to Mountain Blade to Bannerlord and to the third of these little troop tree investigations that I've been doing. And we will today be moving on to the Vlandians, who of course can trace their real life equivalents to the Normans of northern France, southern England, and Sicily. And as such, they definitely have a very Western European flavour to them. Uh, both in terms of their style and their tactics on the battlefield, favouring to have a very survivable heavy infantry of all kinds, um, with a big focus on their armour across their whole faction, um, and of course devastating units of heavy shock cavalry, and at range they rely on crossbows um, instead of archers, and that is um, comes with its own strengths and weaknesses. Crossbows of course individually uh, have uh, higher stopping power, better damage and better range actually than most bows as well, but of course a significantly uh, slower fire rate and generally speaking as well, especially um, in multiplayer you're going to have fewer of them, but obviously in single player as well uh, they're going to be fairly expensive to upkeep. Um, as far as weaknesses and gaps in the Vlandian roster goes, the most obvious one is going to be the fact they have a complete lack really of archers because again fully reliant on the crossbows at range, which can be a bit of an issue. Um, because of course it means they can't get many missiles downrange quickly. The ones they do send will be very powerful, but you do have to bear in mind that Blandy are going to be more at home getting up into the faces of their enemy with their tougher uh, up-close and personal units um, rather than trying to skirmish at range for too long, especially considering the close proximity of both the Batanians and the Aserai to them on the campaign map. But we'll have a little look at their troop tree a little bit further and, uh, and sort of see if we can discern some uh, more nuanced strengths and weaknesses to it. So as we can see right off the bat here from the Vlandians, it's a fairly diverse troop tree in many ways. Obviously you do have a lot of tr um, pathways that you can go down. Um, having said that, in terms of pure versatility, when you compare them to someone like the Empire, who perhaps are the best comparison to the Vlandians, purely because the Empire are the only other faction to really have crossbows in any great numbers, they're also a faction which uh, have a big emphasis on heavy armour and sort of good equipment in that way. And the Vlandians are definitely that way inspired as well. But the Vlandians... Down there, troop trees, one thing that will become immediately apparent is they have more of a focus around certain things than the Empire do, whereas the Empire cast a wider net but it goes shallower. Uh, the Vlandians definitely have a deeper um, focus in, in several areas, but we'll go through that in a little bit more detail as we go through the roster. Starting off, we have the Vlandian recruit, obviously low stats all around, obviously very low wage as well, but again, very similar to pretty much any other uh, unit in the game at this level, um, you're going to get mostly the same thing. The main difference that you could say here is the fact that they do actually have a long weapon um, rather than a sword, which up until now we've seen, had a look at the Empire and the Kuzates. Both of their tier 1 units have used swords rather than spears. I would actually say that it's better to use a sword at this, uh, at this point because yes, spears on an open battlefield do have certain advantages over a sword, but they also do less damage. Um, so it is a bit of a trade-off there. Personally, I would prefer the route that the uh, Imperial recruits and the Kuzate Nomads take over the Vlandian recruits, but for the most part it doesn't really matter, because you don't need all that much experience to level them up, and that is the main hope, of course, the fact that you're going to be moving them past being a peasant wearing just a basic garb and a leather jerkin into something a little bit more focused. And we have the tier 2 options, which you can go down a ranged path or a melee path. We'll go down the ranged path first of all, because it's on the left. Um, and this is one of Vlandia's most pronounced strengths, their crossbowmen. So you start off with the Vlandian Levy crossbowmen, which, again, in much the same way that the Kuzates can field horse archers earlier than anyone else, the Vlandians can field crossbowmen uh, significantly earlier than uh, everyone else, because for uh, the Imperial crossbowmen, of course, you need to get way up to level 4 before you're able to actually get them, um, and they're the only other faction which really can field crossbows anyway. Um, so to have the Levy Crossman this early offers you a lot of stopping power, but do bear in mind the strengths and weaknesses that crossbows have intrinsically. Lower fire rate, but you know better range generally speaking, and higher damage across the board than uh, units of a similar type. They're going to be more useful I think in sieges, especially defensive sieges um, for Vlandia than they are on an open field. So do bear that in mind, especially when you go up against uh, someone like Batania, which is likely to happen early on considering the uh, close proximity of both those nations. But still, to have access to crossbows this early is always going to be a good thing. Up to tier 3, of course, you then move on to the Vlandian crossbowmen. So again, a crossbow skill of 70. You can see the equipment starting to get better. That Western European look, obviously the colours are very indicative of that as well. More so from England than France, I'd have to say, with the reds being the dominant uh, thing for uh, Vlandia. Even if perhaps in terms of a roster, they bear more in common with early France than early England. And I'm looking mainly at the crossbows for this reason, obviously, longbows and, and all that. Um, but 
you know, obviously the Vlandian crossbows, as we go up, it's going to be a straight progression, this. I mean, this is a very simple uh, line of troops to go down. If you want to go down the ranged route with your Vlandian recruits, you only have one path to follow, so there's not really a great deal of nuance. As you go up, the equipment gets better, and their expertise with the equipment also does uh, does the same. So at tier 4, Vlandian, har Vlandian hardened crossbowmen, this is where you start to get the uh, iconic chain that most of the Vlandian troops are going to be sporting as uh, part of their main equipment. Um, and this is where also the Pavi shield comes into effect. So this is obviously a big part of what makes the Vlandian crossbows able to contest those long-range fights, not only because of the stopping power and damage that the crossbows can do, um, but to make up a little bit for the fact that they're going to have a slower fire rate, they need to be survivable and able to take a good amount of Archer Fire, and the Pavi Shields help massively with that. Not only at range, of course, but in melee, if units close them down, they're going to be able to better defend themselves with a large shield like that, um, which of course bears more in common with uh, something like the, the Genoese or the Venetians even, um, and obviously, you know, to bring it back to Mountain Blade, the Rodox um, in Warband. And then, finally, we have the Tier 5 Vlandian Sharpshooter, um, which is where their equipment is at its very best, their expertise with the equipment is at its very best, and this, of course, is pretty much the only ranged option you have as Vlandia, so it does need to be an effective one. Like I said, in comparison to other Tier 5 uh, ranged units across the other factions, you need to be a little bit careful about engaging with just a straight-up skirmish fight, especially with something like the Batanian Fians, um, but also looking at stuff like the Asarai Master Archers, um, you do need to be very careful of that, but they are the most they are the best crossbows in the game They do have the advantages I think over the uh, the Imperial sergeant crossbows um, That are the other option of course, but the Empire does have the option of tacking into both archers and horse archers as well um, So there is that going for them as well But yeah a very simple troop tree progression that sort of you start off with basic crossbows and you end up with elite crossbows with uh, very good equipment back to tier one you have the other option, which I think, especially initially, you're probably going to be investing a little bit more in, because I think Vlandia are more at home when they're on the front foot, being aggressive and sort of pounding their enemies into submission, really. And the first step on that path is the Tier 2 Infantry, the Vlandian Footman, which actually bears quite a lot in common once again. Um, interesting enough, more so with the Kuze level 2 Footman maybe than the Imperial one, because again, they have a focus on a long weapon. Overall, they're going to be a little bit better. Once again, in terms of equipment, they actually bear a little bit more in common with the Imperial Infantryman. Uh, the difference being, again, that the shield is obviously not is, is a big factor in why the Imperial Infantryman is an effective Tier 2 unit. Um, and I would definitely say that for Vlandia, you, you definitely want to be getting up to Tier 3 as quickly as possible with your uh, with your infantry lines, because that's going to be where you're at, uh, you're most at home. And then you have a distinction which very few factions actually have, or at least fewer than you might expect, a distinction between spearmen and melee infantrymen, sort of standard line infantry, because um, you may remember really that the imperial versions, like they kind of combine the two, um, at least initially. Um, so we'll have a look at the spear line first of all. So at tier 3 you can tack in to the Vlandian spearmen. Now it's of course not just the fact that they have only a spear, they also have a side weapon as well, a nice kite shield in typical Norman fashion too. Um, and obviously, you know, genuine armour as opposed to the Vlandian footman. But they have more of a focus around their spears, which of course is going to be quite useful in a open field to help you really hammer home a cavalry advantage, which is going to be important for Vlandia. You do have to consider that. Um, we'll get more onto their cavalry lineup later. But yeah, the Vlandian spearmen, overall, they're a fairly unremarkable unit to talk about because their basic spears are not going to do a ton of damage in a similar manner to the uh, Kuzate spearmen we talked about previously. But having said that as well, as you go up the Vlandian troop tree, you're probably going to, you're, you're definitely going to get better armor than the equivalent for the Kuzates. Um, so that is worth bearing in mind as well. Speaking of which, at tier four we have the Vlandian Billman, which once again is technically a pole arm unit. Um, having said that, the the Vulge that they wield, or Bill, I suppose, kind of the same thing. It's called a Vulge, I think, in equipment terms. But as far as they, um, as the Billmen go. They're more shock infantry than spearmen, to be fair to them. Like they're kind of a mix of the two in, in a similar way to the um, Imperial Men of Leoton infantry are. Um, but yeah, this is an interesting unit. I would say that, again, in a similar manner to the Imperial shock infantry in this game is is something you have to pay close attention to because if you let it run wild and do its own thing you're going to take a lot of losses and by the time you get up to tier 4 you really don't want to be taking losses on units like uh, Billman or even the Men of Leoton that we saw from the Imperial lineup. So you do need to be careful with them. It's not as pressing for Vlandia as it is for someone like Sturgia who really base a lot of their uh, a lot of their strengths around units like this. 
um, because Volandia do have other options, but do just bear in mind that they do require babysitting a little bit more, this kind of infantry. I mean, in single player, you have full control over your army. In multiplayer, if you're playing a unit like this, um, it's a little bit easier to keep control of them and pick good fights, like charging into the back of enemy infantry lines, but it's a little bit harder to do when you have massive armies in single player. So do bear that in mind. One area where a unit like this will shine, however, is on the walls in a siege, whether it's offense or defense. Um, a unit like this is gonna be fantastic. And con sort of continuing that line of thought, uh, we have the Vlandian Vulgier, which again is basically just the better version of that. Once again, they have a good two-handed score and a good pole arm score because they have the Vulge, they have the two-handed sword. Um, all around, this is a pretty fantastic unit for clearing walls and sieges, to be honest with you. But the same principle does apply that I was just talking about. Like, you can't just let them run amok. They have those throwing axes as well, actually, which gives them extra punch. Um, but the same principle does apply. Um, you need to be very careful with them, I think. And it actually does pay... Um, in my experience, to have your shock infantry in a completely separate control group to the rest of your infantry. Because if you send them in on their own and you want to form something like a shield wall, it's obviously going to do no good if your Volgiers or Billmen or even Pikemen, which we'll have a look at in a moment, are on the front trying to form part of the shield wall because they don't have a shield, so the shield will be their body. And you really don't want to be lo losing units this, uh, this high tier if you can help it. But their armor is good, don't get me wrong. Um, but a shield is a massive part of your survivability in this game, especially when you're in the melee fight up close and personal. So do bear that in mind. Then, again, the Vlandian Pikeman, which is pretty much the, the other um, option you have, which rather than focusing more on the two-handed, this is going to be focusing more on the pole arm and, of course, the long pike. Again, in a similar manner to the Men of Leoton Infantry for the Empire, I feel like this is the kind of unit which will really benefit from an overhaul to the way that long pikes like this work, and sort of a pike wall formation to help ward off frontal cavalry charges, perhaps. Um, before that happens, though, I mean, the same thing really does apply. Even more so, I think, because the Men of Leotons, they can function more like an axe in the way that they uh, swing their weapon, whereas these pikes are going to be much more pokey-pokey. And, yeah, I mean, this is a unit which I feel like if I had the choice, I'd definitely go the Fulgier route, because both of them are pretty much as as squishy as each other when it comes to the melee fight, but the Fulgier is going to be more capable of dealing damage in most situations. Of course, the Vlandian Pikeman, having a few mixed into your infantry, is still going to be useful, especially when it comes to trying to establish cavalry dominance. Um, but it is a delicate balancing act, and again, I would say this is probably going to make up a lower proportion of your army. Moving back, however... You can have another tier 3 option, which this I think is probably going to be what people go down initially. The Vlandian Infantry, because this is going to be the melee infantry in comparison to the Vlandian Spearmen. Obviously this is going to be a bit more focused around up close and personal work with their one-handed weapon and shield. They still have the spear, of course, um, which they use as the side arm, whereas with the Spearmen it's kind of the other way around, of course. Um, but yeah, Vlandian Infantry, of course, you know what you're going to get with them. Pretty much the same sort of thing as you would get from the equivalent Imperial troops. Albeit at this level, I think the Vlandian... The armor is pretty much going to be the same for both of the units at this stage in proceedings. However, you have another choice to make here as well. Do you want to go down the cavalry option, or do you want to go down more infantry? So we'll have a look at the cavalry first and foremost with the Vlandian Light Cavalry. Now, the Vlandians do have two units, or two Lancer lines, that they can go down, which again is somewhat unique in the game as it stands, because... Um, you know, most factions will, ba will sort of bi bind their um, Lance Cavalry to either just their Noble Unit or just have it as an option in their regular troop tree like the Kazates do. For the Vlandians, however, um, they have two. Now, this is the more basic variant, of course, because the other one is their Noble Troop Tree. The Vlandian Light Cavalry, however, is a perfectly capable unit of Lancers, and it's kind of similar to the equivalent Kuzate Lancer unit. I would say the Kuzate Lancers hold a little bit of an advantage over the Vlandian Cavalry this unit of Vlandian Cavalry, anyway. Um, the noble Vlandian Cavalry is a whole different beast, but we'll get onto that later. This, however, can be a fantastic tool to pad out your noble cavalry a little bit more, give yourself a much more rounded cavalry line, because one problem that a lot of factions may end up having is not having enough Lance Cavalry to choose from, because most of it will be from their noble units. Vlandia, however, has the luxury of not only having their noble units being exceptionally strong, but they can also give them some riding companions in the Vlandian Light Cavalry line. Of course, lighter armour than the equivalent that we'll get onto a little bit later, but still perfectly survivable, as most Vlandian units at the high end are. And then, of course, you have the Vlandian Vanguard, which, to be fair, is just straight-up heavy cavalry. I mean, they've got the coat of plates over mail, good equipment all around, a heavily armoured horse. I mean, this is heavy cavalry through and through. It may not have the same sort of terrifying presence, I suppose you would call it, that the other Vlandian cavalry unit has, but once again, this is just an accompaniment to that. 
Um, and as that, it's very, very useful. And early on, you're probably going to be more likely to build up this cavalry line than the other one. Um, if you're going for sort of a more unified faction theme, of course. Um, so it's worth it's it's worth mixing these these lads in. I would definitely say so. Heavy cavalry is one of the heavy melee cavalry and shock cavalry is one of the main strengths around Blandia as a faction. Possibly the biggest one they have actually. You also, however, have the straight up melee infantry, which of course is going to be a very important part of your army with the um, the focus around sort of the shield wall aspects of this game. And the Vlandian swordsmen are the first step on that road. Obviously, you have the chainmail armor once again. Yeah, the typical helms once more, the kite shields, better equipment all around. Not really too much to say about these lads. Um, again, the, when, as you go up in melee infantry times, there's very few surprises um, with that. I think the Kuzate Dark Hands are one of the only ones where it's it's sort of quite startling, the difference between them and their tier 4 um, equivalent. And speaking of which, we do have the Vlandian Sergeants, which you can see, instead of a sword, they actually wield a club, which is going to make them, or a mace, I should say, which is going to make them better against heavily armoured opponents. So considering their close proximity to the Empire, um, could be a very useful tool. And of course, the armour in general... Um, is one of the main strengths around the Vlandian, uh, the Vlandian troop tree overall. And the Vlandian sergeants are a really, really good unit of heavy infantry to have on the front line. You do need to be careful against troops that are effective against armour, of course. It's a similar story, really, with the Vlandian sergeants as it is with the Imperial Legionaries. They're two very similar units, albeit with the Vlandian sergeants having a little bit more of an AP focus themselves, um, and with that mace that they wield, and of course they still have the spear as well. So a very, very effective and tough unit of uh, central line infantry, especially if you mix in the damage dealing of the crossbows and the Vulgiers and the support from the heavy cavalry as well. The Vlandians have definitely got a very robust army, which is good at that slow push, um, which uh, a lot of people like. Central to that, however, is going to be their show-stopping unit, which is, of course, their noble troop line, which we'll move on to right now. So here we are with the Vlandian noble troop line, and in comparison to the Imperial one, which again is probably the best comparison, Unlike the Imperial variant, the Vlandian nobles start off on horseback, which is very nice for them indeed. We have the Vlandian squire, um, and if you do find one of these in a village, it does mean that you're going to be able to start up your cavalry line uh, sooner than you might expect. You don't have quite the same access to early game cavalry as a faction like the Kazates do, but as you move through the tree, the equipment of this troop line will, uh, will really speak for itself. So the Vlandian Squire, from a level 2 unit of shock cavalry, it's pretty much what you'd expect. Yes, they have better equipment than the other tier 2 troops uh, that are on offer for Vlandia, but it's not that much better. I mean, they have the male hood, they have the, uh, the obviously the spear in melee, the shield, uh, but you really want to be leveling them up as quickly as you can because the effectiveness uh, grows exponentially, really. Starting off with the tier 3 cavalry unit, we have the Vlandian Gallant which, again, you can see the chainmail, which was more indicative of a tier 4 unit in the regular troop tree, is available at tier 3. You have the large western spear, the kite shield, once again, the sword for up close and personal work. This is where the unit really does start to take shape. And then we move on to the tier 4 unit, which is the Vlandian Knight, which uh, the name will be uh, very familiar to anyone who's played multiplayer, because this, of course, is the Vlandian Heavy Cavalry option there. This is where the horse starts to gain that really heavy, thick mail, um, which uh, the Vlandian Heavy Cavalry is really known for. The Lance, the Club as well, or again, the Mace, I should say, for melee work means against other Heavy Cavalry. They're going to be very, very effective, so if you put them up against something like Kuzate Lancers, or even something like Cataphracts of a similar level, um, the armor piercing can really help, which makes them very, very uh, versatile in that melee fight, which they do need, because Vlandia's cavalry, while it is very effective, is quite one note in the way that it works. Obviously, all of it is shock cavalry, really. Um, shock melee-based cavalry. They don't have any ranged cavalry, so unlike the Empire or the Kazates, who we've already looked at, who have a bit more of a versatile cav line in terms of their abilities... The Vlandians have got sort of more versatility in their equipment in what they use, um, which obviously is important because the Vlandians will want to force that melee fight if they can. Moving up to tier 5, we have the Vlandian champion. This is where you know the skills start to crest the 200 mark, um, which is obviously a very important thing. Again, the club, the equipment just gets better. Male with the tabard over it, the horse still very heavily armoured. And then finally, Vlandia's best unit the Vlandian Banner Knight, which you can see actually in terms of the uh, body armour, it's very similar to the Vlandian Vanguard. The helm is slightly better, however, the horse is heavily armoured, the equipment is all there and accounted for. Actually, I think they they have a sword at their side instead of a club, that's an interesting one. But you can see there the skills, obviously, one-handed over 200, pole arm over 200, riding over 200. In terms of 
being shock cavalry, heavy shock cavalry, the Vlandian Banner Knight is, to my mind, the, the strongest unit of heavy cavalry in single player, at the very least. In multiplayer, it's it's um, it's a different beast, and you have to consider different things. Um, but yeah, the Vlandian Banner Knight overall, I would rate it above the Imperial Cataphract, at least in terms of just being that pure unit of shock cavalry. Which, to be fair, Vlandia does need it to be, because the Imperial lineup is a little bit more versatile and able to bring different strengths to the table. Um, so the fact that Vlandia are doubling down on their strengths does make a, a certain amount of sense there. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is it. If you, if you wanted to be that heavy knight, you know, just on horseback, heavy charges, then Vlandia are definitely going to be for you, because not only is this troop line probably the best single troop line at that in the game, uh, but they also have the Vlandian vanguards as well. You can join with that. Just in general, Vlandia are a very heavy-duty army. Perhaps a little bit more of a slow push, um, but obviously it's, it's going to be a very um, appealing faction to a lot of people, I think, with that uh, the medieval aesthetic that they do have. So yeah, that was a quick look at Vlandia. And next, in terms of uh, Bannerlord factions, I think we're going to turn our gaze southwards and have a look at the Asurai next of all, next up. So uh, yeah, um, it should be interesting. Um, as far as other stuff goes, obviously the Total War content is going to keep coming as well. Um, so yeah, I hope you found this uh, somewhat informative, and I hope you'll join me for whatever is next.